Excellent! This is the Razer Blade 2016 model, updated in late 2016 to add NVIDIA's Pascal-based GTX 1060 6GB graphics card to the mix. A full desktop-class GPU, and not a stupid mobile GPU, mind you. The version that Razer sent over for me to review features a Skylake i7-6700HQ quad-core CPU with hyper-threading, a 14-inch IPS 1920x1080 matte screen, a 512GB SSD, and 16 gigs of DDR4 memory, all somehow wedged into this 0.7-inch thick CNC-milled aluminum chassis and weighing just 4.16 pounds. But I'm a desktop guy, and sexy thin notebooks like this are always overpriced. This one happens to cost two grand in its current configuration, or you can pay 200 bucks less for one with a 256 gig SSD, or $400 more for one with a one terabyte SSD. Too large is a lot of money to spend on a computer, especially when you consider how for the rest of this video, I'm gonna be comparing this Razer Blade to a desktop build, just in an attempt to determine how much of a premium you have to pay for the convenience of portability and I guess sexiness too. Let's finish off specs and features though. That 6700 HQ CPU can turbo up to 3.5 gigahertz on a single core, but it will run at 3.1 gigahertz turbo when using all four cores. The 70 watt hour battery will last for about six hours during media playback or web surfing, and about three to four hours while gaming, depending on what game you're playing, of course. And as expected, you get an 802.11 AC Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.1 module via a killer NIC. And I very much appreciate that you can actually access the internals of the Razer Blade by removing the 10 T5 screws and popping off the bottom plate, which means you could potentially update that M.2 SSD in there, and perhaps even the Wi-Fi card if you really felt you need to in the future. Physically, the blade is just pretty badass. I have to admit, the flat black finish is beautiful and it stays cool to the touch, while not in use at least. The design is simple and elegant with a couple ridges right across the top and a cutout across the front that makes lifting the lid a little bit easier. Rubber strips on the bottom provide some spacing for the two fan intakes down there, but these can get starved for air unless the blade is on a perfectly flat surface. Finally, there is that glowing Razer triple snake head logo which I still can't decide if I love or I hate. Please help me decide by arguing for or against it in the comments section down below. Since this is a 14 inch laptop, the body size is small, just 13.6 by 9.3 by 0.7 inches. And for connectivity, you've got three green accented USB 3.0 ports and a USB type C port that is both USB 3.1 and Thunderbolt 3 compatible. So it can also be used to hook up the cool but also very expensive Razer Core external GPU enclosure if that 1060 isn't doing it for you. There's also power and headphone mic jacks on the left side and an HDMI out and Kensington lock on the right side. All that's really missing here is an SD card slot in my professional opinion. Opening the blade starts the fans spinning and they will continue spinning and making some noise even at idle. Under load, the fan noise can get quite loud, but more on that when the testing happens. I do like the individual left and right click buttons on the trackpad, but the trackpad performance itself is just okay. It's simply not as responsive as it could be, but the software settings that you can adjust in the OS did help a bit. Bring a mouse if you're gonna game, I guess is what I'm saying. The keyboard is also adequate with decent travel for chiclet style keys with scissor switches, uh, so I didn't have much trouble with that, but I do like the chroma RGB lighting. It's a very nice touch and it can be customized if you want. I also like the backlit keyboard because uh, it's especially nice for gaming in a dark environment. They have decent sounding stereo speakers that can be found on the left and right side of the keyboard, and there's an integrated webcam up on top. Lastly, there is the screen itself. On the plus side, uh, it is 1920 by 1080 and matte. I prefer matte to glossy any day of the week, and 1080 is just fine for a 14 inch display while also aligning with what the GTX 1060 is capable of while you're gaming. On the downside, it's not a touch screen. Uh, for that, you've got to upgrade to the Razer Blade Pro, which has a GTX 1080 and a 4K touch screen, starting for the bargain basement price of $3,700. Good Lord. Let's move on to some benchmarks though. So we're gonna start off with some synthetic benchmarks, 3D Mark, of course, uh, running Firestrike Extreme, and I'm comparing the benchmarks for the Razer Blade 2016 to the $750 build that I did a month or two ago. It's got an i5-6500, so still a quad core, but not hyper-threading, as well as a full-size GTX 1066 gigabyte. In Firestrike Extreme, overall score was 4957 for the Razer Blade, graphics was 5248, physics was 9576, and the combined score was 2318. If you compare that to the full size system, uh, you will note that it did not score as high overall. However, the physics score was much higher and I attribute that to the hyper threading that's available on the 6700 HQ processor. 
Moving on to Time Spy, uh, which is a DirectX 12 test. Overall score was 3514, graphics was 3459, CPU was 3864. I was again able to beat those overall scores with the $750 build that I did last month. However, uh, again, you can see the CPU score, the Razer Blade 2016, uh, outperforming again due to the availability of eight threads. Moving over to GTA 5, running it at 1920 by 1080, of course. Average frames per second was 78.8 on the Razer Blade 2016, and the minimum frames per second was 16.5. Comparing this to a full-size stock or reference GTX 1060 that I tested a few months back when it launched, 96.4 average FPS was what it got there. So, so you'll notice the reduced score, even though we're comparing the exact same GPU here. Uh, more on that when it comes to temperature testing and what frequency the 1060 and the Razer Blade was actually running it. Civilization 6, I've just recently added, so I don't have much to compare this to, but again, running at 1920 by 1080 in DirectX 12 mode, average frame time was 19.42, 99th percentile was 24.38, and the AI benchmark, which is again a very CPU dedicated test, scored 30.33 seconds uh, average turn time. The only other system I've tested this on is the Mini ITX build that I did last month, uh, which scored about 16 seconds for average turn time, and there it's just basically the difference in performance that you get with the full-size desktop CPU versus the mobile version of the 6700HQ. Finally, I did a little bit of uh, productivity testing with Adobe Premiere CS6. Uh, just doing some timeline scrubbing was, again, just fine with this uh, particular system. And when I encoded a 6 minute and 15 uh, second 4K video, it took just shy of 20 minutes, 19 minutes and 59 seconds to render out on the system, just using the internal SSD, which is where it was pulling the data from for the project, as well as writing the data to. So I would say overall that's pretty impressive. Again, when I compared it to the Mini ITX build in the 380T with a 6700K and a uh, GTX 1070, that one did it in 15 minutes and 29 seconds. So only about four or five minutes uh, slower than you would get with a full size build. So that was pretty nice too. Let's do a quick noise test. I hope you guys can hear me okay. So right now uh, the system is at idle. It's just been sitting here idling and ambient temperature is pretty cool. So there is some fan noise at idle. You can probably hear as soon as I stop talking. So not too terrible, but uh, it definitely does make some noise even at idle. But let's uh, load up Unigen Valley and let things warm up and then we'll see how, how we fare. So now I've been running Unigen Valley for I'd say a good 10 to 15 minutes. Everything has warmed up and the fans are now spinning at pretty much full speed, which is pretty much what they're going to do when you game with this system for any extended period of time. So let's give a listen. And that is a, a pretty substantial amount of noise, given that it is a fairly small laptop. Um, but again, it's doing everything it can to keep that 1060 cool. Now you guys can't see it, but I'll give you a close up in a sec. Uh, the actual GPU temperature right now is 76 degrees Celsius, uh, and it's running at just shy of 1600 megahertz. That's a big difference uh, between what you would get with a desktop version of a GTX 1060 which under load on average is gonna run, uh, at least at stock frequencies, uh, more around 1850 or so. So you are losing about 200 to 250 megahertz on average of frequency, just because it's in a much smaller form factor, it's having to fight to keep things cool a little bit more, and it's just having to throttle back that temperature, or I'm sorry, that frequency, in order to maintain uh, the temperature and keep everything smooth. Now on the plus side, everything has been nice and smooth, so it is doing a good job there. But I also wanna point out that the temperature where, uh, starts getting warm down in this area, which is where the GPU is underneath the, uh, the well, the keyboard right there. And uh, although the area out here starts out staying cooler, um, it warms up. So this is fairly subjective. I'm just using a little pointer thing to measure temperature. D there at the center of the keyboard, we're getting temperatures, at least spot check temperatures, around 106, 107 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, which is pretty warm. Uh, not quite comfortable if you have your hand right on top of that. Now, at first there was about a 20 degrees difference uh, when I started going, so it was about 95 in this area, and out here uh, where it was still staying cooler, where your wrist rest would be, uh, down to about 65 degrees. However, that has now, I'm sorry, about 75, but that has now also warmed up, so we're hitting 87, 88 there. So 
as this center area warms up, as the GPU gets warm, it's going to warm up the rest of the chassis. Um, again, it's not like you can't use it to play or anything like that. It's just, it's warm. And that's something that you should bear in mind if you are purchasing this laptop. So on the plus side, the Razer Blade gives you desktop grade gaming and processing performance in a form factor that's the size of maybe a stack of a few magazines. The design is both sexy and functional if you can get past the sort of gamery Razer logo and green accents. And the battery life is solid, if not exceptional. On the minus side, as you heard during the game testing, this thing can get really loud and the housing can get really hot. Hot enough near the key components that I would not want to have this laptop on my lap while gaming unless I was freezing to death and it was the only viable source of warmth. Of course, there's also the price, which at $2,000 puts it out of the range of many consumers. So as expected, there's a lot to be said for the price to performance ratio that you can get when building a desktop PC, especially when you're comparing it to a laptop. For around, say, $1,000 to $1,500, depending on where you're doing some give and take, one could easily part out a system that would be equal, if not surpass, the Razer Blade in performance. But you'd have to include a monitor, a mouse, a keyboard, and a Windows license, to be fair, and you definitely would not be able to take it with you, at least not without a lot of hassle and, a, I guess, a very large carrying case. Quick aside here, don't ever put a monitor in a checked bag while you're flying. It never ends well. So if portability is high on your priority list, I'd say about $600 is the premium that you're paying for it here, at least compared to a desktop PC. And having done a fair amount of travel myself in the past couple years, I can totally see why that's more than worth it for some people. That's all for this video though, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and like it and comment, subscribe, and do other things down in the section down below. Also in the description, you can find links to my store where you can buy merchandise, as well as a link to where you can currently buy the Razer Blade 2016. We'll see you next time.